We are discussing about quantum computer and what we have looked at are mainly what is the difference from being a classical computer. So, quantum computer is of a multi state variant, a computer that uses quantum mechanical phenomena to perform operations on data through devices such as superposition and entanglement. On the other hand, the binary classical computer is the one that uses voltages flowing through circuits and gates which can be calculated entirely by classical mechanics. However, quantum computing is not synonymous with using quantum effects to perform computation. Quantum mechanics has been an integral part of modern classical computers and communication devices from their earliest days, the transistor and the laser being the most obvious examples. The phrase quantum computing is closer in character to analog computing because the computational model for analog computing differs from that of standard computing. A continuum of values is allowed rather than only a discrete set. So, these are the basic essence that we have disclosed until now. We went through the pioneers who dreamt of quantum computers in electrical realities. So, first of them we mentioned was of Richard Feynman. Nobel laureate from Caltech. In 1980, he was the first among a few who began to investigate the generalization of conventional information science concepts to quantum physical processes, considering the representation of binary numbers in relation to the quantum state of two state quantum systems. In other words, simulating quantum systems not with conventional computers, but with other quantum systems constructed for this purpose. In 1985, David Deutsch published a theoretical paper describing a universal quantum computer proving that if two state system could be made to evolve by means of a set of simple operations, any such evolution could be produced and made to simulate any physical system. These operations came to be called quantum gates as they function similarly to the binary logic gates in classical computers. And in 1994, Peter Shore proposes a method using entanglement of qubits and superposition to find the prime factors of an integer, a rather valuable process as many encryption systems exploit the difficulty in finding factors of large numbers, the RSA algorithm for example. In principle, his algorithm would far surpass the efficiency of any known computer when executed on a quantum computer. Shor's discovery proves quite instrumental in provoking a storm of research both by physicists and computer scientists. So, these are the basic points that we have looked into. We have looked into the uh, bits or the basic idea behind this computing. We have met the bits as data carriers. A bit can have one of the two states 0 or 1. A bit can be represented by a transistor switch set to off or on or abstractly by an arrow pointing up or down. A qubit on the other hand is the quantum version of a bit has many possible states. The states can be represented by an arrow pointing to a location on a sphere. The north pole is equivalent to 1, the south pole is equivalent to 0. The other locations are quantum superpositions of 0 and 1. So, that is how it is a continuous variable approach whereas, in classical mechanics, it is one of the two values 0 or 1. A qubit might seem to contain an infinite amount of information because 
Its coordinates can encode an infinite sequence of digits, but the information in a qubit must be extracted by a measurement which forces its collapse into the values of an ordinary bit, a 0 or a 1. The probability of each outcome depends on the qubit's latitude. Finally, in order to visualize the qubits, we invoke the block sphere. The block sphere is a representation of a qubit, the fundamental building block of quantum computers as we just mentioned. And so, this is the sphere in which the arrangement of the qubit can be anywhere. Uh, the classical bits keep having their singular values between 0 and 1 depending on how they are. These are the classical bit representations, whereas the quantum bits will have continuous variables that they can assume at any point of time. However, whenever you look at it, it is going to be one or the other as we just mentioned. The key thing which has been utilized is the quantum information exchange part, which is the entanglement. The other part of superposition is also been used, but here the entanglement is the one which is important for quantum information exchange. It is the ability of quantum systems to exhibit correlations between states within a superposition. It is almost like spooky at a distance which was heard Einstein mentioned uh, because of his famous EPR paradox. Uh, when two particles become entangled, their identities merge, their collective state is precisely determined, but the individual identity of each of the particles has disappeared. The entangled particles behave as one even when separated by large distance. And so is the idea that whenever you actually measure one of the entangled state, the other one is automatically determined. And the concept of having qubits also leads to quantum memory. By performing the single operation on qubit, we have performed the operation on two different values. Likewise, a two qubit system would perform the operation on four values and a three qubit system on eight to the power three. It goes by two to the power number. The classical one, however, only is able to do one at a time whereas the quantum one does all at the same time. Increasing the number of qubits therefore exponentially increases the quantum parallelism we can obtain with the system. So, that is illustrated here and uh, that is the advantage which we get by using a single computational step for quantum bits or qubit we can get a lot parallelism which is in the exponential order. We have also explored the idea of quantum cryptography, which uh, where we use the idea of uh, two members Alice and Bob, which is typically used the names, who wish to establish a secret key, but the communication lines between them may be compromised. Alice sends a random qubit to Bob, for each one she picks either basis 0, 1 or 0 plus minus 1. Bob randomly chooses a basis to measure the bit in it. If he guesses wrong, he gets a random bit. If an eavesdropper Eve tries to intercept the qubits, she does not know any more than Bob the basis in which they were prepared. If she guesses wrong, the bit she passes on to Bob will have been disturbed. That is how the compromise is caught. After n bits have been sent, Alice and Bob compare notes as to which basis they have used, all bits where their basis did not match are discarded, the remainder should be perfectly correlated and this is the basis behind quantum cryptography. This was the pictorial features in which this is how the actual setup looks like with a fiber optic device. You can have one set send information to the other set and do this. Uh, this has been actually um, done in reality by using ordinary optical fibers across large distances. So, this is uh, the reality of the um, concept right now um, in terms of information exchange. The other aspect of physical realization uh, which I summarize here uh, are based on the principle that 
attempts have been made in terms of qubits which have been single photons which can serve as good qubits using 0, 1 and 1, 0 as logical 0 and 1, but conventional nonlinear optical materials which are sufficiently strong to allow single photons to interact inevitably absorb or scatter the photon that is the problem. But this is one way. Cavity QED is a technique by which single atoms can be made to interact strongly with strong photons. It provides a mechanism for using an atom to mediate interactions between single photons. So, this is another approach which has been used which is cavity QED. Trapped ions can be cooled to the extent that their electronic and nuclear spin states can be controlled by applying laser pulses. By coupling spin states through center of mass photons, logic gates between different ions can be performed. So, that is the third case. The nuclear spins are nearly ideal qubits and this is by far one of the early demonstration successfully which has been done in quantum computing where and single molecules in this case would be nearly ideal quantum computers if their spin states could only be controlled and measured. Nuclear magnetic resonance makes this possible using large ensembles of molecule at room temperature, but at the expense of signal noise due to inefficient preparation procedure. However, this is a very popular technique because there is already a large aspect of NMR spectroscopy which exists, which is a routine technology which is applied for identifying molecules. And so, this spectrometer is a readily available machine which has been utilized for quantum computing. There are many more newer approaches involving other kinds of approaches, but for this class today we will be focusing on NMR spectroscopy right from the beginning of the principle of NMR nuclear spins and all of that. So, let us begin that part today. So, what is NMR? As I just mentioned nuclear magnetic resonance is the interaction of nuclear spins placed in a magnetic field with electromagnetic radiation. In this particular case generally it is the radio frequency region of appropriate frequency that is what we will be looking at. It is based upon quantum mechanical magnetic properties of atomic nuclei. All nuclei that contain odd numbers of protons or neutrons have an intrinsic magnetic moment due to a property called spin of the atom. Nuclear spin can be either aligned or anti-aligned. So, we can have this as 0 state or 1 state. Under an externally applied static magnetic field, a spin will precess about the axis of the field. This precession movement generates an oscillating field that can be measured and provides information on the state of the spin. In turn, by externally applying an oscillating RF magnetic field, radio frequency magnetic field to a spin, the spin will gradually move from state up to state down 0 or 1 as we called or vice versa. So, this is the basic idea behind NMR. So, let us actually go into a little bit more detail as to how to look at it and the more important part is the liquid state NMR. So, in liquid state NMR operates on quantum particles in atomic nuclei within the molecules of the fluid. Particles with spin act like tiny bar magnets and will line up with an externally applied magnetic field. The parallel spin has lower energy than the anti parallel spin by an amount that depends on the strength of the externally applied magnetic field. Normally, opposing spins are present in equal numbers in a fluid so that the system is magnetically neutral. The applied field favors the creation of parallel spins, so a subsequently imbalance between the two states is generated. This minute excess is measured during an NMR experiment. So, this is the basic idea behind this principle that we are going to have this outside applied field which is going to create a slight excess 
of the spins which are aligned favorably with respect to those which are anti parallel so as to create this situation and this minute excess is going to be the one which will be measured through NMR. By applying an oscillating field of just the right frequency, certain spins can be made to flip between states. This feature allows the nuclear spin to be redirected and this is the principle behind this NMR. So, the importance of the technique as I already mentioned, that it is one of the most used spectroscopic technique. It is after X-ray crystallography most handy tool for structure elucidation of compounds and when a compound cannot be crystallized, which is the common case in many biological systems, it becomes indispensable. And that is one of the reasons of the celebration or the advantage of NMR over many other techniques. Such is the impact of the method. At least six Nobel Prizes have been awarded to scientists in physics, chemistry and also physiology medicine in this field of NMR. So, here are these six. The Nobel Prize in Physics in 1943 um, was due to the discovery of magnetic moment of proton to Otto Hearn from US, Otto Stern from US. The Nobel Prize in Physics in 1944 to uh, Professor Rabi in USA, discovery of resonance methods for recording the magnetic properties of atomic nuclei. Nobel Prize in Physics in 1952 to Felix Bloch, the Bloch equation US and Edward W. Prusnell US for methods of nuclear magnetic precision measurements. Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1991 to Richard R. Ernst, Switzerland for the methodology of high resolution NMR. Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2002 to Kurt Wittig, Switzerland for determining 3D structure of biological macromolecules in solution by NMR spectroscopy. Nobel Prize in Physiology Medicine in 2003 to Paul L. Lutterberg and Peter Massenfield, UK, one from US, discoveries concerning MRI. So, these are the six which has still come in the field of NMR. Uh, for this field. So, what is this nuclei spin? Nuclei which contain net spin angular momentum L also possesses a magnetic moment mu as all nuclei are charged. Their interrelationship is written as mu is equal to gamma L, where gamma is called the magnetic magnetogyric ratio or gyromagnetic ratio whichever way you want to put it. L is a quantum mechanical quantity, its magnitude is governed by L is equal to m h cross as the quantum mechanical, where m is the spin quantum number. So, we may write mu is equal to gamma m h cross. So, as far as the NMR principles go, it is based on the fact that the spin of the nuclear of atoms have magnetic properties that can be utilized to yield chemical, physical and biological information as I have just mentioned. Study of the direct transitions between the Zeeman levels of an atomic nuclei in a magnetic field. Nucleus of spin i will have two i plus one possible orientations. If a magnetic field is applied, then the energy level split, each level is given a magnetic quantum number m. So, when a magnetic field is applied, there will be interaction and if we put the nuclear magnetic spin on magnetic field B, then mu is going to interact with it and the interaction energy is given by E is equal to minus mu dot B. Let us imagine the magnetic field is applied along the z or z direction, then E is equal to minus mu z, z component times b. Let us treat the most elementary case first, that is of the spin half particle, that is the uh, most elementary case because 2 times half plus 1 is equal to 2 possibilities then, that is the minimum possible case. There are two particular cases. When the particle is placed in a magnetic field, its energy state is split into two. 
E 1 is equal to minus gamma plus half h cross over h cross b or E 2 is minus gamma minus half h cross b. So, these are the two different possibilities. Energy gap between these states are therefore going to be gamma h cross b as the separation between this. So, this is how it looks. You have the interaction either as a spin down case where the field is going to be counter towards the direction or it could be spin up. Now, the field is going in the up direction, the magnetic field. So, one is more favored than the other. So, the energy lowering for the spin up case is makes, uh, makes it go at the bottom, whereas the other one interacts with a little bit of uh, to gain a little bit more energy. So, when there is no field, there is no separation between these two magnetic cases, they are the same, but when the applied magnetic field H 0 is provided, then H 0 or B whichever notation you take, then there will be a separation of the two which will be according to the energy gap which is gamma H cross B. The sensitivity of the technique would depend on these few parameters. At room temperature, the magnetic interaction energy is much smaller than the thermal energy which means that gamma H cross B is much, much smaller than K B T. K B is Boltzmann constant here. The Boltzmann distribution governs the relative population in the energy states n minus half over let us say n plus half so will be given by exponential minus delta E over K B T the which is equal to exp exponential minus gamma H cross B over K T. This is going to be as small as 0.99995 for a proton placed in a magnetic field of 7 tesla at room temperature. So, it is a very small entity, we are talking about a very small entity. So, NMR is not a very sensitive technique that way as the population excess in the ground state is very small. However, this drawback can be overcome by lowering the temperature or increasing the strength of the magnetic field because as you can see this depends, this gap depends on the temperature concerned and the magnetic field strength. So, let us see how we can go ahead about this. Uh, so, we can essentially these experiments are done in both the cases where in one case the temperature the sp uh, spectrometer essentially operates at a low enough temperature and it increases the strength of the and it is also operating at a very high magnetic field strength. Many a times temperature cannot be worked on because you want the state of the matter not to change that is why. So, the other important part here is the resonance condition. When the energy of the applied electromagnetic field matches the energy gap, the gap that we mentioned uh, gamma h cross b and we have applied the electromagnetic field h nu, then the transition occurs from the ground state to the excited state. If we use angular ve velocity omega which is 2 pi nu, then we get the famous Larmor equation which is omega is equal to gamma b, where somewhat incorrectly o omega is called the Ramar frequency although it is basically an angular velocity, but uh, anyway it is called the Larmor frequency. This omega is called the Larmor frequency that is because uh, it was discovered by Larmor. The rotational axis of the spinning nuclei precesses about magnetic field at an angle with an angular velocity omega Larmor frequency. So, here is the spinning nucleus with an angular momentum mu and so omega naught is equal to uh, gamma B naught. If we irradiate the sample with radio waves of megahertz radiation with Larmor frequency, then the proton can absorb the energy and be promoted to the higher energy state. So, that is the principle that I just mentioned earlier, it is shown pictorially here. So, the precession of the nuclear magnetic moment sort of looks like this, this is my angle theta, uh, this is along the z axis as we mentioned is our uh, magnetic field working and the precession is uh, by this particular spin, spin particle which is precessing around that. And uh, there are two angles associated with it, 
one is the azimuthal angle and the other one is the precessing angle theta and phi and we can see what is going on with this. So, by application of the radio frequency pulse which is given at particular perpendicular direction to the applied magnetic field. So, this is along the x axis um, the pulse is given for a very short time. So, that all possible NMR active nuclei may respond. So, this is one of the important parts of pulsed NMR. Uh, this is one of the most important developments in the part of NMR because um, unless you use pulsed NMR it is very difficult to get the nuclei to respond properly. Uh, if you are going to excite one nuclei at a time it is extremely difficult to get the right uh, frequency and be able to apply that. So, instead a short pulse uh, in time a lot of frequency are available and all possible NMR active nuclei would respond. The pulse creates an effective magnetic field B 1 thus the magnetization is not anymore along the z axis there is a substantial value of m of x y there is an x y plane application because of this applied radio frequency pulse. When the pulse stops the system strives to go back to equilibrium m x y gradually decreases by means of relaxation processes, but as long as it exists it produces an electric signal in a detector coil placed transversely to the magnetic field. This decaying signal voltage versus time is called free induction decay or FID. So, an FID signal sort of looks like this, uh, there is this voltage which with time goes down because of the relaxation process and this is what is essentially captured as a result of this applied RF field. By Fourier transform FID is converted into the familiar amplitude versus frequency plots and this is how this uh, Fourier transform works. Uh, so, the different steps in Fourier transform NMR device are of this kind an RF excitation is used to raise the proton spins to the upper level as a static magnetic field um, as a result of which proton uh, is being provided this RF excitation in the states which are slightly differing. The proton relaxation process is now uh, is going to happen now. The amplified signal versus time has been looked at then it is Fourier transformed and the signal versus frequency as is being generated. Proton NMR signal at only one frequency because of the constant magnetic field. Now, RF excitation broadband enough to cover resonance of all fields if you apply. So, this is with one single frequency. Now, we add gradient magnetic field of B of G proton relaxation signal received. Now, if you Fourier transform then you will get the proton NMR frequency variation with position because the gradient of magnetic field is also applied. So, these are various different ways of doing NMR. You can develop it to a point that you can do a lot of different applications to it. Now, each nucleus of the same element may not be in a similar chemical environment in a compound. Now, this is one of the most important part of it being acting like a spectroscopy. The relative shielding offered by the opposing induced magnetic field created by electrons around the nuclei is going to be different. Thus, the local effective magnetic field is different and that creates the spectra which is going to be different. The magnetically non equivalent nuclei have different Larmor frequencies and produce different peaks in NMR spectra. The induced opposing electric field is proportional to the applied one that is induced B induced is equal to sigma this is the shielding times the beta B the magnetic field and therefore, instead of seeing a Larmor frequency omega is equal to gamma B there is this part 1 minus sigma the shielding constant which gives rise to different values. Now, in order to get to the more details of this problem and let us get into this uh, in a little bit more detail. So, the nuclei which has both protons and neutrons have a net spin denoted by I which we have already used until now. The rule for finding the net spin 
of a given nucleus is not an easy task. Tip typically, it is based on the fact that it is an experimental value. You can sort of, uh, you can measure the values. However, some nuclei with uh, the spin value of half known are proton, carbon 13, fluorine 19 and so on and so forth. Some higher spin numbers are for example, iodine 127 which has a spin of 5 by 2, N14 has a spin of 1. On the other hand, carbon 12, oxygen 16 have no spin, they are 0 net spin. The key idea is that spin is an intrinsic angular momentum property of the system that we are looking at. The spin magnetic moment therefore, corresponds to uh, quantity mu which we were talking about and therefore, mu is related to the spin magnetic moment by gamma which is the gyromagnetic ratio as we discussed before and this is different from different nuclei. So, mu is equal to gamma i and gamma can be written again in terms of the nuclear g factor g i times mu n which is the nuclear magnetron value which is a constant for a given nuclei. For proton for example, the gyromagnetic ratio is also given here 26.76 times 10 to the minus 27 to the power tesla per tesla per second. So, that is how the gamma and all these parameters are. In an external magnetic field which is in the jet direction as we discussed, the field is the interaction the E m i can be is here we have defined it as the interaction energy of a single spin with the uh, i with uh, acting on the magnetic field B. So, we get this value the interaction value is given by minus gamma times i z uh, b z because it is all in the z dimension minus gamma m i uh, h cross b of z and m i is my magnetic uh, spin coefficient and that can go anywhere from minus i to plus i. So, when we are focusing on the i equal to half this one is minus half and plus half only two values. So, um, m i is equal to minus half and plus and as we had defined before the one which is interacting uh, positively is the one which gets aligned which is in the plus one dimension and that is alpha and the one which is of the other kind is the uh, minus kind and it is called the beta. So, alpha has lower energy than the beta and the gap is given by this value that we have done. So, essentially it is uh, each of these values a minus half h cross gamma beta uh, b z and the other one is e minus half is going to be half h cross gamma b of z. Thus, the degenerate levels plus, uh, plus minus half are separated in energy due to the value of due to b z applied magnetic field along the z dimension. The energy gap therefore, is given by h cross gamma b z. We also saw that the relative population which is essentially an alpha minus n beta over n alpha plus n beta is given by h cross gamma b of z over 2 k b t which is small, but a positive value. A small excess of alpha spin over our beta spins because of the interaction advantage of the alpha over the beta. Now, when an electromagnetic field with the frequency nu is applied which can cause the transition alpha to beta, this will happen only when this matches the exact energy gap h nu is equal to delta e is equal to h cross gamma b of z. So, this particular case we will therefore, get the frequency to be gamma b z over 2 pi which is gamma l which is known as the Larmor precession frequency of the spin resonance and therefore, it is for NMR. Uh, this is the resonance condition. So, it is nuclear magnetic resonance because of this 
particular resonance condition. So, whenever it is this particular case, then it is the resonance case. So, so therefore, it switches on a field of B z, which has some precision value of uh, mu L and electromagnetic radiation is scanned, then the resonance absorption occurs at uh, mu equal to mu L. On the other hand, you can have an electromagnetic radiation fixed at some gamma value, some, uh, some frequency nu and sweep through the B z field until absorption occurs. Again, which is a tough job because you want to change the magnetic field continuously and so on and so forth. Typically, it is the other way around where the uh, as we have seen the frequency is possible to change abruptly by using a small pulse of the radiation field. However, in molecules the nuclei are not bare, they are dressed by electrons. The applied field causes circulation of these electrons in which usually provides an opposing small field to B z. That is we have because of the electrons present in the molecule B of electron, B electron is equal to minus uh, sigma B z. So, this sigma is the shielding constant which is going to be 0, um, greater than 0 which is roughly 10 to the power minus 5 orders and that is the one for which we see a difference. Local field seen by nuclei is going to be in fact dependent on the sigma value. So, B local is equal to 1 minus sigma times B of z and different proton nuclei due to different chemical environment will have different uh, sigma the shielding and therefore, different nu L. However, we see that nu L depends on B of z different NMR spectrometers in that case would different would record different spectra. This is not desirable when you are going to use the NMR as a spectrometer. So, what is done therefore, is that at this point for a spectrometer a little bit of a different attitude is taken. Standardization of the spectra is done by comparing NMR spectra will be done by different spectrometers and this is done by using a scaling factor. So, you basically define a scale for the NMR and um, a molecule called tetramethyl selen TMS tetramethyl selen is used as a standard which has very low uh, magnetic field effect because um, it is the silicon and it has ME stands for CH 3. So, the protons in this particular CH 3 group has, uh, has the least proton effect because it is the standard and therefore, uh, it, it is with respect to this, this is measured with respect to resonance frequency of proton relative to TMS and the spectrometer frequency is the one which is being divided. So, when this scale is being used uh, and this is written in terms of parts per million, so 10 to the power 6 is been multiplied, we get something which is known as um, delta H which is the chemical shift. So, for proton spectra TMS is used as a reference standard and by definition TMS is taken as 0, it has the least changes and therefore, it is considered as 0 and everything else is measured with respect to TMS. So, that is the way the scale is defined when you are doing spectroscopy with NMR and uh, when you define that this scaling essentially makes sure that all the nuclei are going to be seen in the same way um, for the same molecule environment. Suppose, we have two different proton nuclei absorbing at uh, nu 1 and nu 2 then we can apply this standard that we have just done and what we find is that the difference of the two will be a value which will be as a result of the chemical shift difference will be as a result of the shielding of the two. But the separation between the two absorption lines of the chemical shift scale is independent of the applied magnetic field and that is field strength and that is what exactly what we mentioned in the beginning that we did not want the magnetic field to play a role on this because otherwise every instrument that you have will be different with respect to each other the NMR machine. So, therefore, this is one of the scales which have been used all the time in NMR to make sure that this is how it works. Here is an example 
of um, the case of a uh, molecule. So, this is a uh, it is an CH 3 COOH molecule. So, it is an acetic acid. Uh, on a 60 megahertz spectrometer, when this uh, acetic acid is being measured, say you get some numbers like that and you can calculate and how these two difference, different values will show up in terms of chemical shift. However, if you put that in the same on a 270 megahertz machine, you will find that though the individual values are different, the ultimate the uh, separation will remain the same. Uh, 4.2 ppm is the separation which is the same whether you are using a 270 uh, megahertz machine or you are using a 60 megahertz machine. Now, these 270 and 60 uh, megahertz are the values related to the applied magnetic field and that is how it becomes a standard system. In an NMR spectrum therefore, the intensity of the line is however, proportional to the number of the equivalent protons that you have. The delta scale runs from left to right with respect to increasing with the TMS at uh, delta given to as 0 and it is unitless since it is a ratio and is presented in parts per million. Uh, so, for example, in methanol you can uh, find out that due to the electronegative nature of the oxygen, the electron density is smaller near the OH proton. So, the field seen by OH proton is higher than that seen by CH 3 proton and so this gives rise to the expected value of what we see. The intensity of the CS3 line is roughly going to be 3 times the intensity of the OH line and this is how we can find out how this goes. We can do all the example cases of this and this is how the NMR spectrometer works uh, and this is an example of how this looks like. The standardization level is set as 0 and with respect to that it shows how much more the shielding is. So, those with a lot of shielding will be moving uh, basically when the proton is going to have its uh, electron uh, cloud removed from it, it will go further away from the TMS or the starting point further away and those which have lesser of that effect they will be closer to the TMS values and therefore, you can see that CH 3 lies protons lie closer to TMS than OH and similarly you can have this uh, ethanol which will be CH 3, CH 2 and OH again once again it will be 3 is to 2 is to 1 kind of ratio in terms of heights which is what we see here it was 1 is to 3 because it is the number of protons which are being looked at. Um, however, there is one effect which we can qualitatively describe due to spin spin coupling. Now, that is something which is the next part of the story here. Uh, for example, the proton spins in CH3 are affected by spin dipoles of the adjacent protons of the CH2 group and this interaction further splits the CH3 uh, line in the in these cases. So, when it is done at very low uh, low magnetic field then you would not see these spin spin effects, but when you go on to higher magnetic field then each of them will have other effects and that is what happens they have spin spin couplings and this is in accordance to the 2 i plus 1 rule where i is the total spin of the interacting protons. Since there are 2 adjacent uh, proton to CH 3 proton for uh, uh, ethanol, the CH 3 line splits into a triplet. Similarly, there are 3 adjacent protons of CH 3 group, the CH 2 line splits into a quartet and this is how they all look in case of uh, CH 3, CH 2, OH ethanol. The intensities follow the same ratio which is 1 is to 2 is to 3 the total intensities. Okay. So, that is how they come. The intensity peaks follow the binomial form and we can use the Pascal's triangle to predict them as follows. So, this is the basic idea behind the spectroscopy which is also been used very heavily in terms of the NMR. Uh, what we have discussed here in the beginning was that we would like to use this very sensitive technique to go ahead and see how we can make this into a way where it can be used for quantum computing. So, this was the basic to sort of make the connection to how a device 
which has nuclear spins that can be con connected to measuring very sensitively, although the measurement as we can see initially uh, was not very large, but could be enhanced by many other ways. That is what has been discussed here until now. In the next class, we will be discussing how it can be utilized now for quantum computing. Thank you. Thank you.